was fully disabled. I couldn't walk around. I couldn't cook anything like that. I was hooked on morphine and I was a dick. I was really irritable. I was really depressed. And my mum, not a word. She quit her job. She was caring for me the whole time. Uh, and I remember looking at her and thinking, character's a choice. That's the sort of person I want to be. You know, the one thing that doesn't really go out of fashion is being useful. And I think if you set out with the intention of solving other people's problems, then you're immediately playing a game with the top 10% because you're thinking, right, how can I help other people? The first year from that first dollar was 100 grand. Now, then we launched the product, uh, the, the flagship product, so that was 140K. And then three months later was 180K. And then last week was 120K. So it's pinch yourself, right? So we just finished filming with today's guest, who is Kieran Drew, and really just had a story that stood out. And it was inspirational and so relatable, which is this. Kieran was a dentist, trained for seven years to become a dentist, was completely miserable in his role and knew that he had to find something outside of it. And so he starts writing. He starts writing on the internet and it starts out slow. And he even says it took him 18 months to make his first dollar. But in that time, he was learning skills and he manages to accumulate and build such a passionate fan base and audience that a year ago when he put out his course in the first 96 hours, the first four days that this course was available, he made over $140,000. And so I just want to hit that home, right? In 18 months to make his first dollar and then in 96 hours he makes over $140,000 and he's done it multiple times since. And so really what you learn in this episode is the spirit, the confidence and the character of someone that just never quit. The humility to return to step one, to go back to the drawing board and figure it out again. And we break down exactly how we did it. So really such an inspirational story, a true test of faith and believing in yourself and trusting yourself. And without further ado, let's get into the show. I invested 10 years and over $100,000 into my career as a dentist before I quit. Mm -hmm. I quit because I lacked creative fulfillment. The money was great, but that doesn't solve Monday morning anxiety or quieten the voice telling you that work is meant for more. You and I were born to create. Find your thing and go all in. And here's where I want to begin because I love those final two lines. Mm. You and I were born to create, find your thing and go all in. Mm. And I want to start with the context, which is a few years ago, you're working as a dentist. You spent all of this money, over $100,000. You spent years and years of your life doing something which is difficult. Yeah. Like it's difficult to become a dentist. When did you realize that that's not my thing? I don't think there was like a A, B switch, but like a rumbling in the background of being like, this doesn't seem quite right. So I mean, when I started, I thought I'd won the golden ticket because I come from you know, a working class village in the north of England. I've never really had status or money and dentistry, you know, promises a lot of that, especially when you're at school and stuff like, oh, you're going to be a dentist, you're going to be a doctor. And um, after graduating, there was a good kind of two, three years where I was like, this is cool. Like you get paid a fair amount. So I started working all the time. And in my head, I was like, this is what success looks like. And the suffering is meant to be normal and part of that. But over time, you know, every time I'm driving to work, I can't shake this feeling that I'm, I'm making a massive mistake where like, I'm like, you're working so hard on something you don't enjoy. And what happens if you could put all this energy into something that you do? And for me, like I said, that creative fulfillment, man, like I feel like I say this all the time to friends. I think the key to a happy and fulfilling life is being creative, building things for other people. I wasn't really getting that as a dentist. And then I heard about sunken cost bias. So I started reading a bit about the mind and you start learning about all these ways that you've made decisions in the past. And a lot of, a lot of the time, when I was kind of two, three years in, and, and like I said, it's been a hundred grand, we're getting up to 10 years. I'm like, you can't leave. All this all this effort you've put in. And when I read about sunken cost bias, I was like, oh, actually, this is just the monkey mind, right? You telling yourself that because you've invested five years into a career or 10 years into a career that you have to do this for the next 50. 
but you can see how stupid that is, right? You know, when you're 80 and you're looking back, it's like, why don't you just, you know, if, you, if you're not happy, move and like, mm. change the situation. So when I started reading about that stuff, I was like, I think there might be a different way to sort of play the game. And then, yeah, so it was kind of around then. So about 27, 28 years old, I was like, I think you need to abort mission here and, and start again. No, the, the sunken cost uh, bias it's such a real thing, right? And um, it's interesting from like a psychology perspective because you see it with people when they're gambling mm -hmm. and it's like you put in, you start, oh, I'm only going to spend a hundred dollars, hundred pounds, whatever it is. You put it in, lose it. Okay, well, I'm already a hundred in. I'll just get back my hundred, 200, lose that. And it's just you, I think as humans, it's been proven that we find it incredibly difficult to like cut our losses. Yeah. Um, and I think one thing that you said, which is so interesting is right in the beginning, it wasn't one moment. It was almost like a slow rumble of increasing discontent. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious for you to go deeper into that, because one of the things that I think about is like trusting your doubt, like trusting. I remember even when I was, when I was in my job, it's like, it starts out those first few weeks and you're like. I don't think this is right, but mm. you're like, I've already put so much in. Let me just keep, just keep doing it. So talk to me about that experience of like, it just continuing to increase. Was it even instant when you instantly became a dentist? Was it like, this isn't right? Mm. No, it was cool, man. I think it's self-awareness. I didn't really have much when I graduated. Uh, I thought yeah, we're, we're, we're on the path to success. Uh, it's something that had been laid out since what, 17, you've been working towards this. And as I started working and again, classic sunk and cost, I was like, well, I'm not having fun. So let's start training harder. Let's specialize. Let's, you know, bet more money, see what happens. And I also started reading books on philosophy and like I said, decision-making, which I hadn't really explored before. And I started journaling and these sort of things. And it's like, actually, when you start to observe the fabric of your mind and you're like, those little things that were doubts that you're burying with partying every Friday and watching TV every night and all that stuff. It's like, those are, those are there. You're just not paying attention to it. And so when I started journaling and stuff, I was like, you can really see if you read back, you're like, you're not happy with certain things about your career. Mm -hmm. And the more aware I became of that, the more painful it became. Because it's like, well, if you really like loved yourself, would you, what are you doing? Mm. Um, and then, you know, I remember driving to work every morning, listening to deep thinkers and creators. And I, and I feel like, I feel genuinely sad because I was like, I wish I was doing that sort of stuff. But then what would happen was I'd be too exhausted to do anything about it. So you go to work, you're knackered. Um, you know, I was working 10, 12 hour shifts and it was just that cycle, man. Like it was just going on and on and on and on. And the only day I actually felt happy was payday. Mm. I'd see the paycheck. I'd be like, sweet, because there was a plan. You know, I, I wasn't sort of working just to get rich, just to like buy. So I wanted to financial freedom. And I was like, you could do this till 45, just slog it up six days a week and stuff. So I was like every paycheck, I was like, we're getting there. But you know, three years in, I was like, this is a long, long plan. And I didn't know an alternative until someone highlighted the internet to me and I was like, yeah, you can't, you can't, uh, two faces out of the tube, right? It's like, you've heard about this other stuff going on. And it's like, do, do you keep betting on the thing you're doing or do you start again and bet somewhere else? You know, I, uh, I'm going to butcher the quote, but I've heard it multiple times, which is like the nine to five is one hell of a drug. Like mm -hmm. the salary is one hell of a drug. And I think sometimes it's like, you don't even realize the effect of mm -hmm. it. I, I remember being in my job and like every weekend would want to go out and party and drink and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was a distraction. And so I'm curious for you because it sounds similar. It sounds like there was things that were happening, which was like, it was distracting you from the fact that you knew deep down that this wasn't what you were meant to do. Can you talk about that? Because I just think it, it can be so subtle. Yeah. And it just feels like, oh no, I'm 24, I'm 25. Like this is yeah. what I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. Can you talk about that being distracted? Yeah. You, you think that it's going to solve itself. And particularly when you're young and you're like, okay, I'm not quite happy with my career. And it's so stupid because you, you, you pick a career before you can even pick a car. Right. You know, someone when you're 16 or so, you're like, oh, I'm going to go do this thing. And so by the time I graduate, which is 24, it's like, 
are we on the right path here? But, you know, you're getting paid, you've got your mates. So we're going out Friday, Saturday. I've got my housemate as well. So we're chilling a lot. And it, it was, it's a lot easier to numb the pain than face it, I think. And we would always talk about, you know, one day we're going to do this and one day we're going to do that. But there was no like inflection point where you were like, I have to do this now. And the problem was, like, you know, very grateful to say that it's a good paying job. You're like, who are you to complain? Like, you're a dentist and you're getting paid well. And it's like golden handcuffs sort of style stuff. And so you don't really, you're not hitting that complete misery point. You're just not that happy. And you think, well, this is normal. You know, yeah. You know, work you love is a silly pipe dream and so you can kind of just bury that away and then you know like you're saying distractions help a lot mm. and what happened with us was covid hit and suddenly you couldn't you know you couldn't go out every night and all that stuff mm. and you had all this time and it was very very uncomfortable because it was like you've got all this time and it's like wow this is what happens when you have time all that time you've just wasted doing one thing or, or not doing the thing you want to do um that's when it kind of got to the point where it's like, actually, what happens if we start focusing on something else, like to try find what to do? And I think one reason it was quite hard was because didn't know what else you could do. So especially with dentistry, man, it's not really that transferable. Like mm. uh, I can't drill teeth on Twitter. <laughs> and like, I used to just sit there being like, what else can I do now? Um, you know, I think mean, if you go into marketing or something, at least you could go, well, I can go work for 20 different people. Uh, because it was such a specialized thing, I was like, well, you, you, you're fully committed on this path, which is, of course, a lie. Because, again, with sunken cost, if you're not happy with what's happened in the past, it's a gift. You can use it, you can bring it with you, or you can leave it behind. Um, but I think you have to have like, that tough conversation with yourself where it's like, you made a wrong decision somewhere. This isn't the right decision. It's time to face the music and try to do something else. You know what? You said it earlier. You said self awareness. And I think. What you said is something that's so difficult. It's so difficult to have that internal conversation and be like, somewhere you made a wrong decision. Mm. Like you spent years doing this thing. And, and, I, and I just think about it in the level of detail. I think about the exams that you're going to, the studying, the money, time away from family, not hanging out with friends, all to culminate. And you were actually successful. The thing that you set out to do, you actually achieved it. And then to have the self-awareness to be like, it was the wrong thing though. Mm. And I think after all of that, it's then having the humility to go back to step one and be like, what is the right thing? Mm. And being willing to take that first step. And I always say the first step is so critical because that's when you start building momentum. Mm. And that's when the confidence and the conviction can return and that belief. And so I'm curious because I think you actually said something which is incredibly true which is, well, what do I do next? And so for you, like, what was that first step? You understood that dentistry isn't it for me, mm. but what was, when you asked yourself, what do I do next? Where did that start? Okay, quick break. Let me say this. We've interviewed nearly a hundred different entrepreneurs on this podcast. And the common question I always get, what did you learn? What is the similarity across all of these guests? They just got started, that was the key. They made a decision and they stuck with it. The sponsor of today's episode is going to help you do just that and get started. The Premium Ghostwriting Academy. This is Cole's free five-day email course that will teach you how to get ghostwriting clients right now. Now, in terms of Cole's credentials, he built his own ghostwriting business to over $2 million in revenue in just 18 months. And in that time, he worked with over 300 industry leaders writing for them. And he's broken down the main lessons, the core of what you need to know, so that you can start to get those results and start to land $5,000 a month clients. And here's the key. When you get started, you build momentum. And when you build momentum, you achieve outcomes that you never dreamed of. So go to the link in the description. You'll find the free five-day email course. Get started and thank me later. I mean, the worst thing you can do when you don't know what to do with your life is nothing. That was the problem. And so I wasn't doing anything so you couldn't find it. But then 
someone sent me a Naval Ravikant's podcast, which is, you know, if you know, I think I'm sure you've, you've heard it. So it's how to get rich about getting lucky. And he talks about internet businesses, about, you know, pursuing your curiosity. If you don't know what to do, you don't follow the money, you follow what interests you. And so I just said to myself, it was like, right, if, if money wasn't an object, which was the complete antithesis to how I would usually roll, because it's like, well, you want to get paid, what would you do? And don't worry about if it's going to work or anything like that. You have to start doing something for ideas to emerge and to see what you actually like. And so I started, I mean, initially I wanted to do a, because it was COVID, I was like, well, let's just try and build a business. And I thought, um, I wanted to buy phone slips because people were at the gym and like no one wanted to touch bars. I was like, it'd be quite cool to have a phone slip. And mm. I remember contacting these people in America being like, can I buy a hundred slips? And they were like, no. And then I was like, oh, business failed. <laughs> and I just moved on. And I was like, you know, now I wouldn't do that. Obviously I'd be like, let's try. But I had done something. I'd sent an email, which was more than I'd done in the past 10 years. And then I decided, uh, well, what would be a cool career? Stand up comedy. And I was like, just making people laugh would be a fun way to provide value. And so I started practicing jokes. And again, I knew that I'd sucked, but that what had changed was I was happy to start again from the bottom. So I think we need to celebrate quitting more. Um, I think it's a very admirable thing to do, but, but instead it's like, you tell someone that you've quit your job, they're like, oh, it's okay. And it's like, mm, no, no, no. They so console like, you. Yeah, but like quitting's cool. And I think that starting again from the bottom it's only a problem if you're measuring from other people's standards. And since, you know, quitting, I've quit so much in my business. It's like the past three years, it's just been quit after quit after quit. And I love it now. I think that like the art of reinvention and like pivoting with purpose is really exciting. And what happened with stand up was uh, my jokes were awful. The only person that ever heard them was my girlfriend, thankfully, because <laughs> it was COVID. Like I, I could feel the lockdown going and I was like, this is going to be a train wreck. But <laughs> in the mornings when I was writing the stories and the jokes, I was like, wow, man, the four or five hours of my life just disappears and it's pure joy. Mm. And I was like, what is this? And started reading about it and heard of flow. And flow is that, that creative pursuit where you're like, you're fully immersed, you're fully present. And I was like, writing is doing that for me. And so we went back to the drawing board. So, all right, you're not a stand-up comic. What can you do with writing? Uh, and I started looking up writing careers, started finding people like James Clear and Shane Parrish. And it was like, well, let's try to go do something like that. And so if I didn't start exploring, if I didn't start with the crappy COVID phone slips and then think, well, that didn't work, let's be a stand-up comic, it, you have to sort of test, listen, you know, and then start following your curiosity and that's when it starts leading somewhere great. So, um, yeah, I just think the, the biggest mistake is people don't shoot for the minimum momentum. Mm. Yeah. It's like you, you want to be the best at something, but you don't know what it is. And it's like, just do something, mm. just say what would be really cool and then pay attention to what's catching your attention. And this is all I've been doing since. So even with the businesses, every couple months you review how it's going and think, well, which bit was the really exciting bit? Mm. let's go do that 10 times more for the next three months and i just think if you keep iterating like that it might be a slow start moments are really slow start but it the compounding effect of doing stuff you love and, and pursuing quality and committing to a craft like it, we're here now having a podcast chat right yeah I and mean, we spoke two two years ago or so and it's um it works i mean you just have to have faith in that process a little bit faith that is such an important word and you know what i um I think it's so good what you said, which is when you're trying to find your purpose or your calling, the worst thing that you can do is do nothing. And I thought about this as you were speaking, um, this phrase just came to me, which is there's information in the action. Mm -hmm. So taking action doesn't necessarily mean that straight off the bat, you're going to find something that is for you but there's going to be information in just the attempts mm -hmm. in the action. And so when you were doing comedy, it was, th that's actually key was that realization of, oh, but the storytelling, yeah, like that writing in the morning, the scripting or whatever, like the part of the components of what it takes to be a comedi comedian deeply resonated. Yeah. And that was the information you needed. It gets you just one step closer yeah. to finding the purpose. And I think, you know what, I think, a lot of the times when we hear stories of people that 
quit their job. They quit whatever they were doing to do something else. It sounds like whatever they pivoted to was immediately successful. Mm. And in reality, it's incredibly messy. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah, I was the comedian. Then I was selling the phone thing. And then like you're jumping all over the place trying to find something, but there's so much information in the action. And I think actually a key point that I thought about as you were speaking is how do you just not lose faith? Because in hindsight, you can look back and be like, oh, okay, you know, it was all building towards this one outcome. Yeah. But that's because you found the thing. Yeah. But in that moment, all you've done is realize, okay, I didn't like being a dentist and then try to do the phone slips thing. And then that failed. And then I don't, comedians not it either mm. it's just these failures and it's so difficult to to stay positive to stay encouraged yeah. through that and so take me back to that that moment in the journey of like how did you just keep the faith mm. it was definitely hard man yeah i used to call it writing wobbles where every month or so i would hit these deep lows where i was like nothing is working so i wrote for a year before uh, a thousand followers which is like the world's slowest nine to five escape plan on the flip side i was telling myself that if other people can do it why can't i i, I think that's quite an important question i never used to think like that so i always used to have a very pessimistic quitters attitude uh, like a victim mindset like oh, it's never going to work for me and if you think like that you're going to be right if you think the opposite you're probably going to be right too and so you have to again a lot of stuff is internal work you have to like persuade yourself that if I do good work and if I am enjoying helping other people with something I've learned, reciprocation will happen. You have to have a little bit of faith from there. What I tell myself now that I start anything is to expect results in two years, not two months. I think the ability to zoom out and just approach it with a little bit of a long-term lens, because if you go in just being like, this needs to work in three months, it's not going to work. You're going to have, you're, you're, you're approaching it completely wrong. Your mindset's completely wrong. You're, um, there's like a desperation to it. But if you just say, like, expect results in two years, uh, you don't know what's going to happen. So for me, it was, I mean, 18 months to make $1, which again, like that wasn't for lack of trying. I, I desperately wanted to escape my job. Uh, two year mark was my first 10K month. And that only happened from the 18th to the 24th month um, mm. of like the first day that I'd heard of the internet. So um, I think that zooming out and just having, I was like having faith, is, uh, I think you have to back yourself a little bit. Um, you don't have to back yourself to be the best. Actually, I think it's unhelpful to aim to be the best. Uh, I try not to do any of that. I'm just thinking, how can we just uh, see what your, what your potential is? Like, don't think of it like this has to work. It's more of a game. Mm. You know, let's just go play for fun. Uh, and I guess... It's tougher when, if someone is like needing the money or there's, there's a lot of pressure on the result for it, but having faith in like repetition, putting the reps in, the learning, the knowledge, that sort of stuff. I think uh, there's an element of just backing yourself a touch. I can only say that in retrospect. Mm. That's the thing. Um, and so I, I think listening to a lot of encouraging people was the key for me. So someone, the person we met over was Jack Butcher because you had interviewed him. Mm. And I was like, dude, I want to speak to this guy. <laughs> and I just used to listen to people that had done the thing I wanted to do and think, you know what? The path is out there. You might not get to that level, but if you just follow in someone's footsteps, at least for a little while, they've carved the path. You're just, just there in their wake. It should get you somewhere, at least somewhere where you can breathe a little bit and think, right, what are we doing here? So yeah, I think mentors, modeling the mentors, following in people's footsteps and then just putting in the reps and, and keeping your blinders on a little bit. Yeah. And I think um, there's this quote from David Goggins where he says that he gets confidence from the fact that he knows that he's going to turn up today and he knows he's going to turn up tomorrow. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's hard in the beginning because you don't have that level of consistency to look back on and gain confidence from. But as you just keep doing the thing, 
and you just keep seeing yourself make these small, like micro improvements, mm -hmm. that's when the confidence really builds. Yeah. Because then you're like, okay, what if I put this over longer time horizons? Yeah. What if I just give this one more year, two more years, three yeah. more years? To your point though, I know that f there's people, they can't be patient with it. Mm. And it's not even because they don't want to be patient with it. It's because their life circumstances mean that they can't be patient. And I think it's actually something that's incredibly relatable from your story, which is it wasn't like you started writing and then immediately quit your job. Mm. You were doing both at the same time. And so can you talk to me about that? Yeah. Because that's not spoken about enough. We hear a lot about the story of the burn the boats. Oh, I realized I didn't like my job quit the next day. Mm. You did it a different way. Talk to me what your life looked like to that point. Yeah. So I'd been writing for maybe a couple of months and I had to start going back to work uh, with, with COVID. You know, you couldn't see patients during the lockdown. And unfortunately I was working six days a week. So I had two jobs, which would involve 12 hour shifts. So I'd work one place till 6 PM, the other place till 9 PM. And I was like, Oh God, my writing time is about to disappear. And so the original plan was right in the evenings. So do your work right in the evenings. And what would happen was one bad day, one annoying conversation, one terrible bit of traffic and the writing would like, just get brushed under the thing, right? It'd be much easier to flick on Netflix and open up the laptop sort of thing. And so what I started doing was waking up early. You know, I, I told myself, well, look, if, if you start your day building your dream and not your boss's and you just, that's the consistency bit, that's the effort you're going to put in. You just say, I'm going to turn up two hours every morning so that no matter what happens during the day or what results you're getting, at least you're celebrating that effort. And so that was the metric for me for success. I'd have a, I had a calendar and I used to tick off every day that I'd do my two hours of writing in the morning. I'd wake up at five in the morning. Um, and it was cool because it was like, you were going to work. It's like having your own little secret, you know? And I was actually quite chill because like, people were telling me all my like problems at work or the staff were like arguing with each other. And I was like, I am checked out here. Like, I'm <laughs> building my own thing. Yeah. Uh, the only problem was it actually gets harder and harder because you start off with this like, great energy. You're like, God, man, we're doing it. Then you begin to realize that this might actually work. And not, I, I still wasn't getting results, but I was like, man, like if I had five days a week to do this thing, I'm sure it would go well. And then there was this period of like juggling two identities and that's where it got really hard. Mm. It was like in the mornings I was a writer during the days I was this dentist and then yeah, the weekend. So there was a lot of, a lot of sacrifice where, so I stopped watching TV for a year. Um, and every weekend was just learning, 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 learning. Cause I was like, I need to immerse myself in this information. But then when I was going to work, I was like, this is getting really tough because the opportunity and cost was starting to scream at me. I was like, you really don't want to be here. You really want to be writing. And what actually happened, my plan was, like you said, uh, I didn't want to burn the bridges. I am naturally very risk averse, although since becoming an entrepreneur, I've fallen in love with the big bet. And this is the reason why it was because it was by accident. So I actually was starting a new job. Uh, I quit my two jobs and I was starting a new job three days a week. So I was like, we're going to go from six days to three days. And we're going to gradually phase our way out of dentistry. And I was going to start on the 1st of September, 2021. And my boss texted me the night before. And it was a new clinic. It was a private clinic in, in York, best one in the, the center. I was going to be the, the cosmetic star there. So it's like the dream job for a 27 year old. And he texted me and he was like, it's not ready. I'm really, really sorry, but you can't start work for another month. And I'll pay you just, just to relax. And I've never been so happy. And I was, I was running up and down my flat, fist pumping. I was like, hell yeah, like this is sick. And then I sat down and I was like, why are you so happy? And it was because I had time to write. I was like, I've got a month to write here. And what happened during that day was I, the more I thought about it, I was like, Dude, this could be a sign. Because if you start a cosmetic clinic, you're there for another two years at least. Because you're going to have all these cases two, two years long. And I was like, this might actually be, I don't believe in like fate or signs, but I was like, dude, man, if you ever want an opportunity to bet on yourself, this was it. Cause I'd committed to this job nine months before I met the guy we'd been planning for ages. And then, uh, I remember that whole day I went for a five hour walk. I called all my friends, my mum, my dad. And I was like, I'm thinking about quitting my job. What do I do? 
And to be always so loud, you're really brave. I was such a pussy, man. I was terrified of it. Next day, uh, I went to go meet my, my boss and um, he didn't know I was quitting, obviously. And so I was like, are you going to do this? And I remember walking, I was on the train. I was shitting myself. I got there. I walked to the door. I walked straight past the door. Too scared to do it, man. I was having a panic attack. I was in the alleyway being like, you need to calm down here. And then so eventually I knocked on the door. I was like, I'm just going to walk in and tell him I quit. I opened the door and there was like five nurses there and him. And he was like, here's your nurse. I met all of them. Oh. I spoke to them for half an hour, man. They're telling them about equipment that I wanted that I'm never going to use. They were like, mm -hmm. how would you like your surgery set up and stuff? And anyway, I went upstairs, boss sat down and was like, so how are you feeling? And I was like, dude, I need to stop you right now. Like I am out. I'm done. And, uh, and that was it, man. I walked out that, the practice after <laughs> persuading him that like, I am not having a mental breakdown. And I remember that first step onto the pavement, someone smiled at me as I walked past and I looked at her teeth and I was like, that's not my job anymore. Mm. And it, that feeling of being like, you know what? I am going to bet on myself. We, or oh, I hadn't made any money yet, but I figured there's people doing it. And it's like, it forced my hand a bit early because it was either quit now, quit in two years. Uh, it forced my hand early and naively I was like, we can get paid within a week, you know, we'll go, we'll go find clients. It took me six months. Yeah. It took me six months to, to make my first dollar online after quitting. And uh, so again, I, I'm not like the bravest guy where, where they're like, oh, you just go find clients. You just charge $5,000 to write. Dude, it was, I, I couldn't even charge someone $50 to write for them. There was so much imposter syndrome and stuff. So it's not been the, uh, the massive, impressive success story it's been messy from day one no i like that I, I just think it's so it's so powerful and i remember exactly the same experience i didn't get it as bad as you when i was leaving my job i didn't have the five nurses all huddled around <laughs> in the, i don't know what i would have done but i remember being so certain that i was making the right decision and yet there's still that hesitation there's still that like are you really going to do this? Mm. And I remember actually once I'd made the decision and uh, I'm on this rooftop in New York and I'm kind of just looking out and I'm looking at the buildings and the Manhattan skyline. And I remember it just felt like I was like exposed. Yeah. It felt like I'd almost like stepped off a ledge yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's like, we put so much identity in our job. Yeah. And I think you even said it, in the beginning, especially as a dentist, there's so much validation that comes from being a dentist. You tell someone, they, they ask you, oh, what do you do for work? Or maybe you're at like, uh, you're getting drinks at the bar, or you're hanging out with friends, or you're at someone's birthday, a wedding, whatever. What do you do for work? Oh, I'm a dentist. You can say it, it's so easy to explain and yep. it's instant respect. Yeah, yeah. People's Everyone, eyes would light up, man. Yeah. Uh, I look quite young as well, or I did at the time. Um, lost a bit of hair since I became an entrepreneur. <laughs> people would be like, wow, that's really impressive. Tell people I'm a writer now. Like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the starving artist yeah. sort of thing. You, you don't really understand what goes on online. But uh, I mean, even last week I was in the lift and there was a dentist in there who I was going to work with at the practice. And... Um, I was there in my, my joggers. Mm. I look like crap. It's like eight in the morning. Uh, I'm like everyone's going to work. And I'm just going for a walk, like my morning walk ritual. And she's like, so what are you up to now? And I was like, oh, well, I, I quit dentistry to, you know, to become a writer. And just like sympathy in her eyes. She's like, oh, good for you. <laughs> you, know, you pursue your dream and stuff. And I was like, in my head, I wanted to be like, things are going well. And I was like, you know what, man? <laughs> it's better to succeed in silence, I think. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, if you're measuring by external metrics, success, status, money. It's very easy to build a prison for yourself. Mm. Very, very easy to build a prison for yourself. And um, I try not to do that now. Yeah, it's, it still happens. It's very alluring, these things. And we're just monkeys, man. Like mm. Monkeys with mobile phones. And so you, you constantly have to work on this stuff. And I think, um, well, for me, it's all about trying to like live a value first life. Because if, we, if, we, if we're at least aligned with what you value, it's like, uh, you know, if you're bowling and you put up the guardrails, you're going to be making all these decisions, but your values, if you're like, well, am I doing what I think is important in life? Am I spending my day doing what I think is important? Then when you're faced with decisions for taking on another job or selling more of your time, it's like, do I value that 
or do I value how I think people will look at me after? Um, mm. I'm still, you know, it, I'm not great at that. I don't think any of us, yeah, it takes a lot of work, but I think if you want to be happy, you need to be able to, uh, re- you need an internal compass, right? Like you need to realize success is subjective and that's also part of the fun. I mean, it's, it's a really nice journey if, if you're happy to do the work. Yeah. And, it, and it's such an empowering thing to be truly spending your time and working on things that feel important yeah. to you. And it's interesting, that question of like, what does matter to me? Mm-hmm. And I think there's certain experiences. There's a few experiences in our life that when we reflect on those moments and those experiences, it perfectly crystallizes what's important. It really puts everything into perspective. And I remember actually reading on your Twitter, this quote from Naval, um, and he goes, we have two lives and the second begins when we realize we only have one. And so I'm curious for you, when you reflect, when you reflect on your life, and that decision and what gave you the conviction to just go all in mm. and break out of that prison, which you're right, it's the most <clears> difficult <throat> thing to do. Is there a certain experience? Is there something that you went through that just crystallized to you? Like, it is so important that I go for it. Okay, quick break. One of the things I hear time and time again is that people want to produce content but they want to do it everywhere. They want to be on Instagram, LinkedIn, newsletter. The sponsor of today's show is going to help you achieve that, Cast Magic. Cast Magic is a software that helps you extract maximum value from your video or audio content. And here's how it works. So you upload an audio or video file into their software. It generates a transcript using AI, and it also generates a bunch of interesting and valuable assets based off of that transcript. So I'm talking things like summary of the content, uh, newsletter posts, LinkedIn captions. They have this AI chat feature where you can ask it questions and prompts about the episode and it will give you answers. We actually use it to help us do thumbnail titles and episode titles. So useful. It's been a complete game changer for us. And here's the great news. I've hooked you up. When you go to the link in the description and you use the code Callum Free Month, Callum Free Month, you will get your first month of Cast Magic completely free so that you can try it out and experiment with it. Without further ado, let's get back to the episode. Yeah, that quote's a killer. I remember when I heard it the first time, I was like, damn, that's it, right? And it, for me anyway, it jogged a lot of stuff from when I was younger. So uh, when I was 16, uh, I used to, I had, I had a twisted spine. So it's called scoliosis, right? And my family, we used to joke about it. We used to call me crab boy because I walked a bit funny. Mm. And uh, then I remember one day we were in the supermarket and my dad was like, shit, man, like, you're starting to walk pretty bad. I was, I was kind of walking like this. And so uh, we went to hospital. Uh, it's been called scoliosis. It, it's you know, fairly serious, but it happens to a lot of people. And we had the scan and, you know, the NHS, so our, our medical system is slow. Hmm. And I had the scan and you think you get called back in two, three months. So we got a, a letter or a call a week later. You need to come back in. And so we were like, it's serious, but like, it's not that serious. So something else has happened here. So we went back into the, uh, to see the consultant and we're in this cramped consulting room. Yeah. Dimly lit and he lays out the x-rays in front of us. And he's like, uh, we found something. And you just, you, you, you're going to like drop. Right. And so he's like, look, um, your spine's bending, but we're just looking at the top here. And what it looks like is that you have a uh, tumor in your spinal cord at the base of your brain. Thankfully not cancerous but growing and my neck was broken in like five places and I used to get blinding headaches and you know I'd always been a bit, a bit stiff and stuff we never really thought anything about it and uh, anyway so it all kind of clicked together and he was like look your back's bending <laughs> that's fine this neck thing you need to get sorted immediately because if you don't there's a really high chance you'll be disabled by 30. Uh, I've, I've already lost a bit of sensation in my right hand where it, it was putting pressure on the nerves so I've got a bit of a tremor and stuff now um, so he's like, yeah, we need to do it by 30. And I was too scared to do it, man. I, I was way too scared. So I said, let's do it when I'm 18. At least let me get my A-levels. I don't want to screw up my education. Mm. Um, but inside, I was like, I was just putting off these difficult decisions. And 
when I when we turned 18 or when I turned 18, it took a year out of uni. I had the operation. It was uh, 14 hours long. You know, they said, there's a chance you might not walk when you wake up. Chance you might not wake up at all. Like the, the consent form was like a book, right? Hmm. Everything went well. And you know, I remember waking up and uh, sun was shining through the windows. The nurses were all laughing and joking and they told me it's fine. I felt top of the world. And then the morphine wore off <laughs> and it all came crashing down. Hmm. And that, that night was the longest night of my life because it was like the worst headache you've ever had. Uh, they, they'd like hammered with chisels in the back of my head. They cut away a bit of the skull and then they fused everything together. And so I sat there for like 12 hours being unable to sleep, unable to move. And it was like a really dark point in my life. But before that operation, massive victim mindset. Always anxious, always worrying. Why me? I can never really get what I want. I was a fat loser. Like I didn't have any friends, that sort of stuff. There's something very humbling about hitting rock bottom. And... I couldn't walk, man. I, I couldn't shower without help with my mum. Uh, I couldn't shit by myself. All this sort of stuff. And so I, I, when you're kind of reduced down to the bottom, you, you find out about incremental progress. One step at a time. And from there, turned my life around. You know, got fit. Started to learn about trying to be like socially aware and learning how to talk to people. Kind of getting addicted to progress, right? But then when we got, by the time I became a dentist, I was like, well, let's take everything I've learned about stoicism and hard work and progress and put it to building a great career. Lost track again. The incentives, the money, the status, all this stuff, you get sucked into the game, right? And then I found the vow and he told me that quote. And I was like, you already have been told you only have one life because you could have been dead at 18. And I was 28. And I remember my doctor just telling me, you know, you would be disabled by 30. And I was like, dude, man, you got two years? Why are you doing work you don't want to enjoy? Because you only get one life and only you're living your life. So you might as well bloody well enjoy it. And so that was a really nice catalyst to be like, yes, betting on yourself is terrifying. But if you actually look at it, you're not going to die. We had this conversation when you were talking about your job, right? It's like, mm. we're not going to die if it doesn't work. You get another job. You're not going to break down, like, it's not the end of the world. And so that was the thing that I always came back to. I was like, look, man, like, quit dentistry. Worst case scenario, you lose all your savings. Um, and then you just start work again if it doesn't work out. And so since then, I, I think about my neck constantly. Not from like, oh, I'm so worried, but being like, man, this is a great gift. Like, you've learned what real shit looks like. Hmm. So... Don't let small problems like these imaginary anxieties completely shape your reality, right? It's like you, you have to be able to rationalize stuff and look at it from what it actually is. And that was the next side for me, man. Like, yeah, it was really good. You know, it's, um, there's even this tweet. I actually have it. I have it here where you say, 12 years ago, I broke my neck. Then doctors found a brain tumor at the base of my skull and my spine bent by over 56 degrees it was the best time of my life. Yeah. And like when you read out the tweet, the that final line, it's like, it almost reads wrong. Yeah, yeah It's yeah. like with everything that came before, this was the best time of my life. And I think whenever we reflect on our experiences and what we've ex just happened to us in life, there's certain inflection points, right? There's certain points where you're like, that was kind of a turning point. Mm. And you almost have, you either have a gratitude or a deep resentment to those moments. And the reason it's so binary is because you either went like this after that moment or you went like this. Yeah. And there's someone out there who is feeling like they're in that rock bottom place yeah. Yeah. that you described. Maybe not in the way that you described it, but for them, it feels like rock bottom. Yeah. And for you... Years later, 12 years later, you can say it was the best time of your life. Yeah. And I'm just curious, what was it that you were doing in that moment that it just, it's almost like a split second decision. You just made that decision that, no, this isn't going to define me. Yeah. Um, it's going to define me only in the positive sense. Mm. Like I'm going to be able to look back and say, that was the moment mm. when people talk about the success or whatever you achieved, that was where it started. Mm. What I have come to realize is you can't 
control a lot of things in life. Most of it is outside of your control. The one thing that you always have is the way you respond. And I've taken pride in that. I, I wasn't very good at the start, man. Like, like I said, I thought my life was over and I was responding very poorly, but it was like, you, you get to choose how you interpret an event. And actually, even when there is nothing good to take from a situation, there's still an opportunity to improve your character. And I vowed to myself, um, then I was like, well, let's always try to be the most positive person in the room. I want to be the guy that accidentally, like, you get your leg chopped off and in a couple of days you're making jokes about being Legolas or something, right? <laughs> like, I just think that no matter how bad things get, if you have an internal compass where you think, this is all an opportunity to practice how I respond. That can only go well. Because what's the alternative? It's like if you start to paint every bad thing that happens in a negative picture, it's only going to get worse. You know, it defines who you are. And so, yeah, with the neck thing, like I said, it wasn't, I, I wasn't like, I didn't come out as some stoic superhero from there. A lot of it was actually learning from other people. So for example, my mum, uh, I came back from hospital after three weeks and I thought, uh, all is going to be well. I was like, I'm going to walk the dog, play games, it's going to be a sick year. I've got my gap year, I've got nothing to do. And it was horrible, man. Like I was fully disabled. I couldn't walk around. I couldn't cook, anything like that. And so uh, I was hooked on morphine and I was a dick. I was really irritable. I was really depressed. And my mum, not a word. She quit her job. She's caring for me the whole time. Uh, and I remember looking at her and thinking, character's a choice. That's the sort of person I want to be. Mm. And since then, it's just been, it, it's a thing you practice. You know, like philosophy is not a decision, right? It's something you live every single day. And so you, you have to train your mind to respond in the way that you want. And I think a big part of that is actually seeking the hardship. So since then, you know, I haven't broken my neck every year, thankfully. Uh, but I tried to do stuff that I don't want to do. And I tried to do it a lot just to practice being the guy that responds well. So uh, my girlfriend thinks I'm weird, but like when it's raining, love walking in the rain with a smile on my face. Just pretending it's not raining. Because if you could be that person that does that in everything, right? Mm. Uh, I just think it's a really cool way to live. I'm like, why not? And it's something anyone can kind of learn, right? Like I said, I, I was a very unhappy person before that operation. I do feel like if you go in with the intention of practicing how you feel, like you can really, you can get to like 90%. In, in terms of like how happy you are or how mm. well you're responding so yeah you know what it's like I just I had like a moment when you just spoke and you said character is a choice like I just think that's so that's so powerful and the reason why is because we can't control what happens to us like you don't get to decide that and so often it's like we're living life and things are going fine and it's almost like someone enters your life stage right completely messes it up and it's in chaos mm -hmm. and it's like it can be the most difficult thing in the world not to be resentful of that mm -hmm. and i just think what you said is so powerful of character is a choice just come back to that character is a choice yeah. it's really about how you respond yeah how you respond to it and you know what we even when you left your job and we spoke about it when you're doing something new, those initial stages are difficult. Mm. It's difficult because it just doesn't feel like anything is working. Mm. And I remember, especially in the last year, earlier on when I'd left my job, I remember the feeling that so many times, like nothing is working. Um, and you try, you try coaching, consulting, agency, <laughs> all of this stuff, trying to sell different things. No one wants to buy. Yeah. Like no one cares about, you're, you're sending emails to people. Oh, are you interested? No, they're not interested. Yeah. And so talk to me because you, you, what you've done is phenomenal. And like, we've had calls in, in the last year and even the most recent one that we had when we were discussing, uh, potentially doing this episode, it was incredible to me when you were telling me that, um, you released a course and in the first four days that that course was released, you made over $140,000. Mm -hmm. So it took you 18 months to make a single dollar. Yeah. And then in four days, over $140,000. Yeah. And then you've done it again since then. And it's yeah. like crazy. But talk to me about, I want to get into how you did it. Yeah. 
and just building that craft of being a writer. Yeah. And so talk to me about what you learned. 18 months to make a single dollar. The Kieran that's standing before me or sitting before me today. How would you almost advise someone else if they wanted to achieve that result yeah. that you have? What would you tell them? Where to start? Well, I mean, first in terms of the time frame. So 18 months to make that dollar, but it you have to appreciate that you're, you're gathering skills, right? You're gathering knowledge, you're testing and, and all that stuff. And then, so I, I monetized uh, two years ago, 31st of March. The first year from that first dollar was 100 grand, which again was five years ahead of the plan. Um, then we then we launched the product, uh, the, the flagship product, so that was 140K. And then three months later was 180K. And then last week was 120K. So it's, we just come, it's pinch yourself, right? So we're, we're, we're getting close to seven figures now. And yeah, like it's trying to look back at how it ended up like this. I think there were, you, you can piece together success in retrospect, right? It's very easy to look back and be like, this is the thing I did and this is that. I think there's a certain attitude, A, starting scrappy. Uh, we done the same thing. I, 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 I quit my job and I was like, I'm going to be a copywriter. And then I was a coach, a consultant. I was a ghostwriter. I was doing everything. And yes, nothing was working, but only if you're measuring it by how much money you were making. Actually, what you were doing is you're, you're finding out where we're going to go. You're picking up skills as you're going along. And it's like, the, the thing I'm probably most proud of over the past two years is being happy to quit to com completely strip away the business. And uh, I think of it like pivoting with purpose, right? If you, if you stop seeing it as a failure and being like, well, what did I learn from that bit? Which thing did I really enjoy? What didn't I enjoy about that? And how can we shape the next three months based on the metric, the, the signal, right? So I've been working in three month sprints, just doing this over and over where I'm like, that went well, that didn't go well. Let's get rid of the bit I didn't enjoy. Let's do more of the thing I did. And the inflection points of each part of the business was when it wasn't when I started doing more. It was when I started doing less. It was when I, I said, right, like one thing. Well, so the first six figures was scrappy. And you know, like Charlie Munger says like making the first six figures is the hardest thing you'll ever do. You've just got to do it right. You've got to hustle as hard as you can and all that sort of stuff. And, uh, but I remember getting to January and being like, Oh my God, this is, this is out of control. I was, uh, running a coaching program, uh, consulting calls, doing all the writing. It was 12 hours a day and I was exhausted. I couldn't sleep even though I was exhausted because you're so busy, busy, busy. And I was like, well, you know what? You say you don't care about money, put your money where your mouth is. Got rid of all my clients, got rid of the coaching, uh, revenue dropped by 80%. What that let me do was commit to the craft writing. Because I was like, if you had to pick the one thing that you nail, everything else happened. Like people, people underestimate the power of committing to a craft. It's not about building the skill. It's about building the reputation. The better I got at writing, the more things opened up. The more things opened up. Like People started asking me, where's the writing product? Uh, that, that's the only reason I built it. I was like, you know, I want your systems. I love the way you're writing. I love how you're doing things. That was only because I had the time to do it. When I was so busy, there was no time. I was just busy going nowhere pulled in a million directions mm. and so just executing one thing well and using that as the springboard for the next thing uh that's all i've been doing since then you know what i love about your approach and i know this through our conversations is you are incredibly audience first and so if people really want to understand how you did it the approach at a high level is build an incredible amount of trust yeah. with an audience yeah. Be audience first mm. and then building that audience and is scaling it to a certain size and essentially getting it to the point where like, it's almost like people are like baying for blood. Like mm. they're just, they're like, what's the product? Like, I trust you so much. Yeah. What's the thing that like, how can I take this further? And then it opens up so many different lanes in terms of where you can go. Yeah. And and you described it well, right? Which is like you have coaching, consulting. You'll see um you'll see creators, they'll do brand deals, yeah. um, affiliates you could do, you could build your own products. Yeah. And really the approach is, and it's in the name of your product, high impact writing. It's like build the high impact audience first. Yeah. And then that is going to lead to you being able to monetize that. Yeah. 
in some way. Well, I remember looking at the people three steps ahead and yeah, I can never compete with these guys. I'll never have the audience size I'll have. I'll never have the revenue figures I'll have. Like, what can I compete on? And I was like, relationships. Because, you know, one thing that bigger accounts don't have is um, they don't have the time anymore. They can't do the things that don't scale. And so from day one, I've replied to every single email. I still do. Any customer that buys anything from me, I send a personalized video. 2,500 customers. <laughs> a lot of time. And so all these little things, I you have to understand what you're optimizing for. And for my business, it's for my fans. And so every single decision has been, how do we become the guy for them? And so part of that was, I gave away so much for free. It's like, there's like eight free video courses knocking around online. People always like, why, how can you be okay giving away all this for free? And it's like, the thing we're optimizing for is not revenue, it's relationships. And you have to have a little faith that the downstream effect of that is revenue. And then right now there's a big thing in, in, in my space where they go, oh, free content doesn't work. It's all a lie. It's all a mosey lie. Mm. Free content works if it's good enough. You have to prove that you're worth investing in. And so my whole ethos is that you treat everyone like customers before they buy. So that when you do release a product, the exciting part about a product is it's at scale, right? It's a highly leveraged thing. It costs me no time for fulfillment. I'm not pushing people to, I'm not like pushing or persuading. I'm just inviting people to invest. I'm literally in the emails. I'm like, take it, leave it. It's all good. Like mm -hmm. there's stuff you could do. And that approach, I think, particularly in a world where everyone, a lot of people are quite pushy or it seems to be all like me, me, me orientated. I, I love being that person that will give more uh, and over deliver at every opportunity. Mm. And so even when they do buy, I want every single part of it for them to be like, this is sick. Uh, you know, they get tons of emails. They get the personalized video. Like, They want to ask me a question. I'll send the video back, full answer. And like, you're not meant to get that with a $300 investment, right? That's cool. Because in my eyes, word of mouth. Mm. If you can get word of mouth, it's like having an army of people to build for you instead of you having to do it yourself. So these launches, for example, I mean, the one we just finished a couple of days ago, I was completely burned out. Um, I still have a bit, which I had a big coffee before we spoke uh, because I spent two months trying to build, uh, upgrade the product. Um, I gave it away to all my audience for free, uh, the customers. And I was like, I don't have any, I don't have any energy for marketing. I can't market like I used to. It was like beforehand, I was like, let's go all day, every day. I was a zombie. And I was like, this is going to flop hard. What happened on social media? All my current customers just started sharing it. All of them were like, you need this thing. And like, mm -hmm. when you can have your audience being like, this is worth investing in, you will not be disappointed. It's just your job to then put that word out to other people. I was just sharing, being like, cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, people want that relationship, but they don't appreciate that you have to give, 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 give. And then when you make the ask, it can happen quite big, particularly when you think about digital leverage. Mm. You know what, let, let's talk, let's go deeper with the, the give, 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 because I think the problem that a lot of people have is, and, and you spoke about relationships and true fans. There's a process to even just getting true fans, yeah. like even to just getting to the point where people are, it's actually quite a few rungs in the process for you to get to the point where people are emailing you. Mm. And in the beginning, it's like a black hole. There's no feedback. Mm -hmm. No one's commenting. No one's emailing. Uh, no one is tweeting at you, oh, when's the next product or what's next or where can I buy? No one's doing any of that. Yeah. And so I'm curious about for people that are in that beginning stage where they're like, they don't even really know what they should be talking about. They don't, there's nothing is getting traction. How do you even, how does someone even just get started? How do they figure out like, okay, this is the thing that people will actually be interested in specifically from me. Mm. Like, how do I even get there? I think the first caveat is reminding yourself that the start is supposed to suck. I think before you get to prove it to the world, you have to prove it to yourself that you have what it takes. Mm. The thing is with audience building in particular, people are skeptical, right? They don't know you. They haven't heard of you. And so you have to accept that the first year, no one's really going to be listening that much. Just remind yourself of that. You know, expect results in two years, not two months. That's mm. the first part. And then you say, well, where, where do you get started? Well, 
I think the most important thing, you know, there's, there's loads of ways to build your brand. You could be inflammatory, you could be controversial, you could do you could hacks and tricks and gimmicks. You know, the one thing that doesn't really go out of fashion is being useful. And I think if you set out with the intention of solving other people's problems, then you're immediately playing a game with the top 10% because you're thinking, right, how can I help other people? How can, not myself, how can I help other people on the basis that we have faith and reciprocation? And then you think, well, what, what problem do I solve? And again, there's a few ways that you go about that. It's like, well, what are you doing for your work? And if you love your work, brilliant. That's what we're going to build the audience around. If you don't, like me, I'd be a much more boring writer if I was writing about teeth. It's <laughs> like, well, start looking back in your, in your past and thinking, what's the transformation that has helped me the most? How can I begin to help other people doing that? Because the internet's a really big place. It's the exciting part, man. Like the law of large numbers. We're not special snowflakes. There are a lot of people struggling with the problems you've already solved, searching for the solution that you've already figured out. And you have to have a bit of faith, again, that if you start broadcasting that solution, you will begin to attract people with a like-minded thing. So for me, I started writing about philosophy and mindset because of the neck. I think if people were saying, oh, I'm not really getting the momentum, you're going to have two things here. For one, build it and they will come into lie. So uh, that's the reason why it took me a, a year to get a thousand followers. You know, I'm just writing away and thinking, oh, no one's reading my blog. God damn it. Like, why is it only my mum reading my emails for like six months? Funnily enough, I can see the opens, right? She's not even reading the Bible. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, mom don't, my mom don't listen to this either. Yeah. Well, it's tough. My mom now does. So she reads every email and so she'll be listening to this. So, you know, they, they all come around. That's the yeah. point, yeah? Um, so build it and then come as a lie. And so if you want attention, you have to go where attention flows social media, other people's audiences. So someone like me now, I spent three years building my reputation. That's where you start. You find the people that you like and you begin engaging in their stuff. Not like, again, you don't just rehash what people are saying. It's such a waste of time for everybody. But you start providing value. You start showing you're a real person. You start showing, and value is a buzzword, right? But it's like, mm -hmm. you give useful advice, you show personality and you share a bit of your story. Go do that for a while. And then when someone does engage in your stuff, you know that one person that hits like, they're your hero now. They're, your one job is to make that person love you. Because if you can get one person to become a true fan online, it's only a matter of reps till mm. you get a thousand, right? And so what happened for me was people started engaging on my stuff and I was like, well, I'm going to reply to them all the time. I'm going to send them a message, like, oh, what's up? And so by the time I was like, oh, I'm, I'm going to release my first product, which was a piece of crap if I'm honest with you, and people were buying because they were like, it's Kieran, like, you show you care about your audience's success, they'll care about yours too. Uh, it's, I don't think people are willing to put in that grunt work. Everyone wants the scalable business when actually it's the unscalable things that are the catalyst to get that going. I really, I really like the way that you frame it in terms of like, you have to give value, like be useful. And I think so much, you're, you're right, that is a buzz term. Everyone says, oh, give value, give value. And then it's like, what does giving value mean? And I know for me, the way that I thought about it was I took the human that I was a year ago, two years ago, and I just thought to myself, I want to create content for that person. So what were, the, what were my problems at that time? What were my insecurities? Where did I want to get to? Because if you can speak perfectly to a single person yeah. and they can feel that, like, that is my guy. Yeah. Like the way that he framed it, he articulated exactly what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. That connection is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And we all have... Uh, we all have creators that are like that for us. 100%. We have certain podcasts, newsletters, authors, whatever it is, even actors, musicians, that the way that they frame the problem speaks perfectly to us. Yeah. Sometimes to the word, like to the detail, it speaks perfectly. Yeah. And so if you can create content for that person, it's like a lot of the problems that we face are not unique to us. Mm -hmm. What you said is actually so true. There's a bunch of people that are in exactly those same shoes. Yeah. And so you can build an audience from that. I guess the thing that I'm curious just to, to build off that. So um, let's say I'm doing it on Twitter or LinkedIn, mm -hmm. I'm starting to build that initial base of an audience. There's people that are coming back. I'm seeing the same sorts of people comment, like, reshare my stuff. Um, 
how do I really develop that specificity of like where I need to focus? Because when I, when I look at what you do, it feels like you understand your lane, Mm -hmm. like you understand your value prop. And I think in the beginning, it's like, you're kind of trying a few different things Mm -hmm. and you're almost trying to bring everything under one umbrella. Mm -hmm. How did you kind of make the decisions of like, oh, okay, this is why people come to Kieran Drew. Mm -hmm. Like this is it right here. So I'll have to just be completely honest. <laughs> I haven't got a clue what I'm doing, man. Like, it's, that, it's that classic from the outside looking in, this guy's got it all figured out thing. It looks polished. Dude, man, it's not polished at all. Like it's mm. chaos up in here. Every <laughs> single day I'm like, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? Mm. Um, and, and I think giving yourself a break because this is this, this turtles all the way down, man. Like no matter what level you're at, you're always confused. And so I don't have it all figured out. The thing that I have decided is that for one, I let go. So I'm trying not to grab the perfect sentence that defines me. You know, like I'm I'm having faith that niche or avatar or business is not a one-time decision, but an evolution. And so when you start looking at it that lens, it's like, well, how do we evolve? It's being out in the environment. And so all I'm trying to do is provide value to be useful to other people to entertain and educate which is the important part like people don't just find you for the information right chat gpt could do that they find it's the messenger not the message Mm. and so i'm just trying to work out the best way that i can tell people stories that inspire them that motivate them that make them laugh whilst also being like here's some stuff to help you with your own journey so definitely don't have it figured out uh from there um But that internal game of pursuit of quality, Mm. that's what we're doing now. Because I have been reminded many, many times that you are spread too thin. And right now I'm spread too thin. And it's like, if you are doing one thing well, this is your area of highest potential impact, right? Once you find that thing, for me, that's writing. For you, it's podcast. Once you find that thing that, that lights you up, that you love to do, regardless of if you're getting paid or not, it's your God-given duty to like go all in because the sicker you get at that one thing, everything else just follows along. And so for me, I'm just trying to write as much as possible. So what does it mean to not just like, oh, I need to build 10 courses, I need a coaching program, all that stuff. It's like, let's build some courses to help people win. But more importantly, let's get good at writing. And that's my North Star. Mm. A lot of people don't have a North Star. They don't really know what they're optimizing for. And again, so I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm knowing, I know what I don't want to do. So if someone goes like, Karen, you should have a high ticket. Right? People will pay you loads of money to work with you. Right? I only do one call a week at the moment. And so oh, when people tell me that, I'm like, oh, maybe I should. You know, it was sick to, to like see that money coming in. And it's like, what are you optimizing for here? Like, what are your values? For you, you say it's mastery, it's impact, it's character. Where does selling all your time come into that? And so uh, I'm always just trying to think, is this going to help me write more or think better or think clearer? Mm. And if it's outside that remit, we brush it away. Mm. And I'm just going to have faith that if I keep doing that over five years, something will happen. Yeah. You know, you know, it's interesting. So Uh, A couple of weeks, I'm flying from New York, from JFK uh, to London Gatwick. So I'm flying to London and I had this conversation with someone on my team and we're talking about the mission. What's the mission of this Mm. podcast? Um, And it's interesting because obviously like a few months ago, we really blew up and it's easy once you start getting the validation of Mm. the views and the spotlight to think that what you're optimizing for is views. Mm. And any great brand, any great storyteller product, whatever it is, they never optimize for the metric. Like Mm -hmm. it's never for, oh, I'm doing this for views. Or like, if you think about even like a couple, a company like Apple um, and Steve Jobs and who he was as a founder, it wasn't just like the dollars that he was optimizing for. There was a mission there. And I remember just reflecting on the plane. I was like, and and a plane is the perfect place for this sort of uh, thoughts because there's nowhere to go yeah. and there's like no internet and you're just there with your laptop, like what the mission and you're just thinking about yeah. it. And the mission that we came up with was that uh, we want to be the catalyst for millions and millions of people to trust themselves. 
Love that. And as soon as we came up with that mission in that level of just being succinct and concise, it cleared up everything. Mm. It was so clear what sort of brands we should, that should be sponsoring this show. Mm. It was so clear what co- sort of conversations and what sort of guests we should have. It was ultimate clarity. Yeah, And it sounds like you kind of, um, you're in the process of also like, you have that same clarity around what you're doing, what you're optimizing for. I guess I'm curious when the money side came in Mm. because you're building an audience and you're having success and you're doing things that not everyone is doing. You're creating these touch points with the audience that are resonating. What made you made the decision and how did you make the decision that, you know, it's a course or like we're, we're ready, we're ready to do the course. I've always been fascinated by leverage. That was one of the main reasons I quit dentistry. I just thought when I first heard the term leverage, I was like, this seems to be the way that you get to live the life you want by being in a high leverage position. And even when I was building, a lot of people were telling me courses were dead. Uh, You know, course model doesn't work anymore. doesn't get people results. You have to be a community, all that sort of stuff. And I just remember thinking, well, I like courses. Uh, you know, the, if someone's ever, what are the things that have helped you the most? I can name the three courses that I love. And I was like, well, why don't you just build that for the person you used to be? Mm. Serve your shadow, right? What you were talking about yeah, before. Yeah, serve your shadow. And, um, and I was like, well, cool. Let's just do that. Because at the end of the day, all these paths work. Every path works if you commit to it, right? So whenever someone, someone tells me that a business model is dead or this approach is dead, it's like the only thing that is actually dead is low quality. Mm. And the reason why I liked courses, man, was because you build it once, you sell it many times. Anytime someone would buy the course, there was zero fulfillment from me. That seemed to align the most with the plan for writing because I need to spend as much time as possible thinking. And that can't happen if I have calls every afternoon. I need to be walking and reading and doing all this like high leverage thinking. And so I liked the course model because it was a way to A, make an impact at scale, which is again what we're optimizing for. I want to help as many people as possible. Courses are a great way to do that. B, it gives me the time to pursue mastery. So again, it's all about values. Um, and that model I just really enjoy. Yeah, I really enjoy. Yeah. You know you know what um, I, I want to talk about is all of those things that people say. So courses are dead. Courses don't work. Um even a lot of people that think like courses are like scammy or mm. like this is the new way that everyone's making money now. It's just mm. a scam. And you spend the time to develop this course, you prepare it, you release it. The first 96 hours that this course is out, you make $140,000. And for me, the interest isn't even so much that event. It's more that I know from speaking with you that it was all in the preparation. Mm. Like that wasn't an accident that Mm. just occurred. It wasn't, you just got lucky. And so talk to me about that. What is it that you were doing when you reflect on it? What were the, the key almost needle movers that meant there's a lot of people that release courses and it doesn't get any traction. You got like an outsized result. Yeah, yeah, Yeah. Why is that? Caveat, it's all feeling like a fluke, man. <laughs> I, have to, I, I, I don't think it's a healthy mindset, but cannot shake the feeling of fluking it. Mm. Uh, so when someone tells me it's like, uh, you know, it, it's, all, it's all going well for a reason, I'm like, <laughs> tell me the reason. But saying that, again, we come back to the principles of like, what's within your control? I can't control how these four days go. What I can control is the effort beforehand. And so... Launch one, uh, I mean, we started building the course four months before. I started marketing it four months before. So no name, nothing. I just went, like, people are asking for a course. Would you guys like a course? Click this link. And what I was actually doing was building tension. Because you know, I think mean, the big mistake that people make uh, when it comes to their marketing is they expect their audience to be ready and waiting. And it's, this is a performance. Uh, I got this from Chris Williamson actually because you know nightclub promoter and he was like the way I run my podcast is how I do as a nightclub promoter and I was like that's genius 
And what would you do if you were doing an event? You don't just go like a few days before, yo, do you want to come to my thing? Right, you're there like, this is going to be the sickest thing ever. And so I started building in public and I'm, I'm very, very bullish on building in public because I think it's telling your story in real time. So I was showing all the behind the scenes of filming the course, the bloopers, the mistakes, the fears. I was letting everyone in and just being like, this thing is coming. So then when it did actually launch, I didn't know how it would go. And I'll be honest with you, dude. So my first launch, I made $5,000, right? Top of the world. That was the best feeling in my life because I was like, oh my God, this thing actually works. The internet works, right? The second launch, I was like, don't go in with expectations. So I'm a, I'm a huge fan of having high standards, low expectations, right? So I, the standard was high at the time for me. Um, of course you go with expectations, right? And I was like, send the email and I was like, right, I'm gonna put my phone away, I'm gonna relax for a couple of hours. Just staring at Gmail being like, oh shit, what have I done? Mm. No one was buying. Mm. Uh, first three hours, eight core sales. And I was like, this is about four or five months of work. And in my head, I had already started the building in public bit where I was like, I'm gonna have to send some funny emails here being like, well, that was a flop, <laughs> let's do round two. Yeah. And then what happened was, uh, you know, the first day, ended up going okay but the snowball effect of reciprocation of um presence people building it like people talking about it for me uh the final day was a 100k day and for someone that had been grinding for two years to make that first like you know the first 10k month i was like this is absolutely ridiculous and that finished after the four days and then i thought well there are signals in the success, right? And so I thought, well, we, we're going to have to relaunch the course. So it was always going to be an open shot because I wanted to build it with the people that bought it. I wanted to be like, if you buy this now, you're going to get all my attention. For uh, I want to make it sick, right? I want to build it with you. And people love that, by the way. Like if you bring your audience with you, that's one thing that really helps where it's not, hey, you need to buy my thing. It's like, look, I've built this thing for us. Uh, let's go do something cool with it. And then I started thinking, well, if that went so well the first time, maybe we just try to do it again in September. What went well? Again, what didn't go well? What went well? And so we, I began marketing it the day after. You know, this course is coming back out in September. And then when it came to September, I was like, you can't do that again. 140, like, don't go in expecting anything like that because you're just going to be disappointed. And it, 180. And I was like, oh my God, what the hell is going on here? Um, but I just think... There are certain things you could do for work, you know, like, you know, go learn how to do copywriting. If you build a quality product, I mean, that's a big one. So you mentioned about scammy courses. I'm a firm believer that if your course feels like a scam, it's because you know it is a scam. You mm. haven't put in the effort. When I built my course, I was like, man, if someone takes action on what I say, there's a thousand X value here. This is $300 and yet the stuff I'm talking about has helped me make 750K, right? And it's like, the I think if you're committed to the quality of your product, you don't worry about the marketing thing. You don't care what the haters are saying because I'm like, I know that writing will change everyone's life. I'm a firm believer that it's the best skill in the world. And so when you build based on that, when you have that mission, like you said, you're like, man, it's always your duty to get out in front of people. And so I think building an excellent product, doing something very well, learning the necessary skills around it, uh, it all comes together in this like, what Charlie Munger would call like a, a Lollapalooza effect, right? It's, it's, mm. it's a sequence of things that all done well cause an exponential result. And they just leave us everywhere, right? And if you can actually break down a process and think, what are the little tweaks that we can do that other people aren't? I mean, that's the big bit. It's like, well, your competition isn't willing to do this thing. Um, doing those little things, man, I think it adds up. So even launch number three, three weeks before I released a 8,000 word essay, I spent a hundred hours writing it for free. Have it everyone, right? Obviously it's really nice to do these things, but what I noticed was a lot of people that get to my level, when they start realizing that, hey, choo choo, the money train's coming, right? Build more stuff and sell it. I was like, well, what is your competition not doing? It's like, well, what they're not doing is carrying on with the excellent free stuff. So I was like, well, let's build the best essay you could ever write. Give it away for free. The reciprocation, man. And it's like, by the way, I've got a course coming out of the month. Uh, if you thought that was good, I think you'll like this. Uh, it, the score takes care of itself if you actually put in the effort on the, on the needle movers. Hmm. You know what? There's something that comes to mind for me, which is, uh, and that's why I mentioned preparation 
uh, even in the way that I framed it, is I know that before, it's not that you just release. It's like you're building the tension mm. and everything beforehand. And I think, why would someone not do that? Like, what's the reason why someone would not do the marketing, aside from just the work, like mm -hmm. the fact that it's work to four months before you release, to already be putting out marketing and tweets and content and essays and all of this stuff. And the biggest reason that I could think of is actually very psychological, which is there must be a level of anxiety of, and I don't think now, because now that you have the, you have the evidence to prove that it works, yeah. but before you have the evidence, it's like, am I going to be doing this marketing and putting out this content? And then when I eventually do drop the product, it's like, no one's going to care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there must be an anxiety of like, okay, I'm putting out this stuff. But I don't know, I could just be doing a bunch of work on the front end. Yeah. And then when it comes time for like, okay, this is when we recoup and you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. it happens, nothing. Yeah. And I'm curious, when you were doing it in those initial stages, whether those moments of almost like crippling anxiety mm -hmm. of like, what if this just doesn't work? And what if I was just giving away free stuff mm -hmm. and it literally was for no outcome? Like mm -hmm. it was... There was nothing on the other side of it. Dude, I still feel like that every day. I don't really know what's working, right? Mm. But the only difference is the way that you approach things. It's like anti-fragile mindset of being, I either win or I learn. Mm. And to me, it's always been, it either goes well or you've got a story to tell. And so like, even when I was trying to find my first copywriting client, so embarrassing, right? I announced on Twitter, like I literally said, watch out world. I'm going to nail this thing, right? And I was like, I was reading the street, being like, what have you done, man? That is so embarrassing. I had to write a thing about three months later, failed. <laughs> and it's like, you either win or you have a story to tell. And so when you're doing all of these things, I mean, my first product, again, I, I was too scared to talk about it a lot. I still built in public, um, but I, you know, again, I was quite timid about it. Nobody will promote you if you don't promote yourself. You have to be your own cheerleader. I remember hearing these things and being like, I can see that because if you don't make noise about like who you are, no one's ever really going to pay attention. And I think a lot of people, they make a lot of noise, but there's not really any substance. But when you think you've got something of substance there, like something that's genuinely helpful, then it's your duty to make, to make a lot of that noise. But end of the day, man, it's like, if the free courses don't work, let's bring it back to the fundamental. Did this help my one true fan win? And that's always been the metric where it's like, have I created something today that helped my one true fan win? Have I learned something new? Have I got better at my craft? Mm -hmm. Because yes, there's going to be bumps. I've had a lot of bumps, man. Like it's been a very bumpy ride to where we're at. I anticipate the exact same for the next couple of decades. But if you have that, like, can I bring it back to the internal comforts? Can I play games that I'm winning no matter what the score? Have faith, man. Like if you're doing good work, right? And Course number one doesn't work. Great. And what did you learn? You learned how to market, you learned copywriting, or you learned how to not do it. And you know, well, we have to go change these things. And so I think if you're just looking at everything as a potential lesson, plus time, which is always a big one, zoom the hell out. Like it, that, that's the process I'm, I'm running with. Mm. You know, I think the, uh, the thing I like about talking with you is just like the humility of it all. Because I think so many people that once they start to achieve outcomes that other people want to replicate, mm. they act like there's no problems. Mm. And like, it's almost like they've reached this new plane where like everything is good now. <laughs> and I just ride off into the sunset and it's all good. And you're very open with like, I still have a lot of these doubts yeah. and fears. And, and it's kind of just a lesson of the fear never goes away. It just evolves. Mm -hmm. And I think about how your fear has evolved of like, you know, the dentist who's afraid just to walk into the office and just tell people like, this is what I'm doing. Like, this is what I was meant to do yeah. and leave their job. Yeah. And now it's like, it's built, it evolved even to like build in public. And there's certain points where you're like a bit you know, something didn't really work and you don't want to share it. And then it evolves past there yeah. into like, I'm actually curious, where is the fear now for you? Mm. Like when you, when you reflect on it, what is the thing that you're just, you know, I, th I think with fear, there's like these things in our mind that we almost don't even want to think about it. Yeah, It's almost like that dark kind of like creepy thing in the corner. You're like, let's just act like it's not even there. 
I'm curious, what is that for you? I mean, the first point to make here is that I used to see fear as the thing to avoid. And I'm a firm believer that the ability to like reframe the way you view the world is as close to a superpower as you can get. Fear is a brilliant indicator that you're on the path. Right? You're outside the comfort zone. You're doing things that you didn't think were possible. And so now when I feel the fear, it's more of like a, a welcome friend as opposed to this like adversary. Mm -hmm. um, saying that, I mean, what are we worried about now? I can't stop thinking about this concept called, or what I've called in incentive drag, where you start off with a really well-intentioned mission and as results roll in, it begins to catch your eye, right? So like if you could actually visualize the journey that's like a straight line, results have a magnetism to it. You're pulled towards it, right? You know, you know that you can say certain things to get better engagement. You know that you can make certain business moves to make more money. And the thing I'm quite scared about or I can see happening that I'm now trying to correct is like, what the hell are we actually trying to do here? So I started reading my blog from 2020 and the writing was awful. The ideas were good. And I was like, mm -hmm. actually, and it was, it was a horrible thing to realize, man. I was comparing it to my Twitter and being like, I think you were thinking better about a few things then. You haven't mm -hmm. evolved in the way that you think you have. You've evolved as an entrepreneur. You've evolved, uh, I think we've got done some, some things quite well, which I'm very proud of, i.e. how we treat the audience, that sort of stuff. But I was like, you, you started the writing to be a writer and you're becoming a direct response marketer different game both mm -hmm. great games but i am quite scared of being like how uh you're constantly chasing the win when it's the internal game it's always been the internal game and it's like you have to like we say it's just different levels of this staying aligned to the values right and so um, i'm really really pleased i'm very grateful to say the business is probably going to cross seven figures this year but I don't want to be the guy that just gets sucked into the game and be like, oh, well, now I'm just writing about writing for the next 30 years because I know that I could sell writing to other people. It's like, for me, I'd love to write books. I'd love to have a blog that when someone finds it, they go, I love the way this guy thinks. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I'm that. And it's like, you, you have to pick the right lane to get that right. It takes a lot of time to be a clear thinker. I feel like I'm just starting that journey. And you can only be like, the, the balance between entrepreneur and artist is really tough. Mm. and is that a fear i don't know it's the next it's the next struggle so even when we finished the launch uh yes yesterday morning uh i had like 10 minutes of happiness and then i was back in my journal being like right, what we're we doing mm. and it's like it, 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 I, I think that's one thing i'm scared about is uh working so hard my whole life and realizing i didn't appreciate the journey that's a that's a scary thing because it's um even last night, I was in an entrepreneur dinner and there was a guy a few steps behind me and he's like, I'm not really satisfied where I am. You know, I'm a, I've quit my job. I've got to my clients. I'm creating content. I'm still not satisfied. And I was like, I was giving him this advice being like, dude, it's, it's all good, man. It's all going to come. And then I was like, wait, I'm not satisfied either. <laughs> and it's like, that never stops. And so I'm, I'm scared to live my life and be like, at the end of it, be like, dude, you didn't enjoy the journey like you should have. That takes a lot of work. So I'm, I'm trying to do that now where it's like, slow down pursue quality keep your blinders on don't get sucked into the game and then be like you know what man i, I loved every day how I, I spent it um that's what's motivated me and that's a fear thing and a and a nice driver too mm. you know it reminds me and i'm gonna butcher the quote um i remember seeing this the quote from chris williamson he's speaking with alex hormozzi and he quotes alex hormozzi and he says um you told yourself you would be happy when you achieved what you already have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you've already achieved things and you told yourself that when I achieved this, I would be happy yeah. and you've already done it. And now the goalpost has moved to something else. It's and it's actually, shift. it's like a scary thing to even think about because I'm exactly the same. And I, and it's, and you know, I pay attention to the emotion even behind it, which is like, there's some things that I've achieved and you don't even feel excitement. Yeah. You just feel like good yeah. onto the next. And it's like this, there should be an appreciation of what you're doing, yeah. of the fact that like there was times when you were younger that you used to dream yeah. that you would achieve certain things that you're doing now. Mm -hmm. There should be an appreciation of that. 
it's maybe it might alienate a few people when I say this, but I don't mean it in a bad way, but success is actually quite simple at one point. When you start getting it, success is simple. The hard game is being satisfied with the success. I think that's the real challenge, right? The person to be so self-aware, to be like, we're all just monkeys chasing the same like top of the status thing, right? And there is no top. And to be the person that, uh, I, I can't get into the philosophy of being like, you don't need anything. Uh, you don't need to win. I, I, I like, for one, what else are we gonna do with our life, right? I wanna do something cool. I love the pursuit of progress. I love watching the way you evolve as a person, just trying to see what you can achieve, right? But I think a lot of people, myself at points as well, you you forget that the, the, the journey is the destination, right? Mm -hmm. And that takes real work, especially as you start to win. So like you said, dude, if, if you told me five years ago, I'd be sitting here with you in a podcast studio, just having another brilliant launch, I'd be like, you must be so happy. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you've, you've got to really bring that back and be like, pleased, not satisfied. There's a cool balance of it where you're like, look, I'm, I'm hungry for more, but my identity and my self-worth is not wrapped up in achieving more. Mm -hmm. And that's work, man. That's, that's, it, it's easy to just hustle all day at one point. When, when you're an entrepreneur, it's easy, right? Like, mm -hmm. well, again, he has that thing, like, wake up and work. And actually, I think waking up and working is the mistake. I spend, when I wake up, half an hour, I just sit down and journal, right? And it's not because I don't want to work, it's because I need to control this thing mm -hmm. to, to really get the most. And so um, there's a different game to be played and that internal game, that self-awareness game is the hardest one, but I think that's the one with the most reward. Yeah. And you know, it's actually something I learned from uh, Kobe, uh, Kobe Bryant, because he would always talk about the power of just being still. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll try it because I, I like to meditate. And it's funny when I go through these periods of intense work yep. and I'm like, okay, I just need to be still. Like, I just need to be just almost just slow down a little bit. And it was like, you'll just sit down in a chair and you'll like breathe in and you'll just try and quiet your mind, have mm -hmm. things be still. And it's like instantly all of these thoughts come in your brain. Oh yeah, you need to send that email. It's like, it's almost your brain is putting you into action. Mm -hmm. It's like stimulate. It's like, no, 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 we're not being still. Go back. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you have to keep bringing it down, yeah. keep returning to center. I think you need to have faith in that as well. Like the, um, it's much more easy, much more easy to be productive instead of creative. Right. Mm. Uh, but I've had the same man, especially when you when you when you're responsible for the results, right? Mm. It's addictive, like it's fun. But dude, there were times where I would be exhausted during the day and I would go to bed and I close my eyes and I would knew immediately that I was gonna stare at the back of my eyelids for the next five hours thinking about work. Mm. And I wake up in the morning exhausted, I'd do the same thing over and over and over. And it's like actually as an entrepreneur, particularly when you have leverage, judgment only gets more important. And if you can't switch off your mind. If you can't disconnect and make better judgments, you're always going to be making poor choices that lead to poor consequences that don't get you the result you want. And so that's the, the thing that I'm struggling with the most now that I spend the most time with is if you are a social media entrepreneur like us, the nature of your business is you are constantly connected. Mm. The nature of your mind is that you need to disconnect. And so what I do, um, for one, there's no social media on my phone. So I had to ask my girlfriend to go on my Twitter to message you because I was standing outside the podcast being like, I don't know which studio I'm in. Um, so there's no social media. Yeah. There's no email. I don't check my phone for the first eight hours of the day. And so I've done all my creative work. I don't get to speak to clients. I don't get to do any of that. Walk for 60 to 90 minutes a day. Very rarely with a podcast. All of these things are boring. They're, my mind is screaming at me to be like, dude, put on a podcast while you train. Or whack on YouTube while you eat. And it's like, you have to, I don't know, man, like it's, it's a very, the attention thing We we give it away so easily mm -hmm. and you wonder why you're not thinking clearly or you're making better, you don't feel happy or satisfied. It's like your phone is the answer, right? And so, yeah, I'm very, very, very bullish on the whole, what can you do to think better? But online, dude, it's the only quality of ideas that set you apart. Hmm. Chat GPT can do the rest, right? Like the the way that you build your business and all that stuff requires judgment and judgment requires time. And you know what the key is? I think um, for anyone who's interested, it's like really studying leverage yes. and understanding that 
Um, and I remember Den Denzel Washington even says this thing where he says, um, don't confuse motion with progress. Mm. People confuse motion with progress. Mm. You think because you're just doing a lot and you'll see a lot of people, they do a lot of busy work. They're always active, busy on social media, even in the office. Yeah. They're the one that's always talking to someone, always at the laptop, always at the computer. And there's people that they make a few, a very select few deliberate moves yeah. every year, every few years yeah. and achieve it tremendous results yeah. and it's because their their judgment is so sharp yeah. and it's so precise yeah. and obviously there's a process to get to that level of expertise and skill yeah but it's really understanding leverage it's one of those words like i remember when i first heard it it's like, i kind of get it uh, you know never just did the key to freedom whatever it's how you get results about doing as much work but i'm two years into my journey and i'm still blown away by the potential of leverage and what I'm learning about it. And so um, I've been thinking a lot about it recently. And I, I think that particularly online, we have five pillars of leverage, right? And the first thing here as an entrepreneur or as whatever you're doing in life, I think you only have two choices for everything you do, money now or leverage later. Can't optimize for both. So for example, when you spend four hours every morning learning how to write for a year, when you could have been cold DMing clients, you are losing money in the present, you're building leverage for later. And so the first kind of like, there's kind of like five pillars of leverage, right? And the first pillar is profession. How good you are at the thing you do is a leverage point. Because if you are average, you're always going to be working really hard for an average result. No one's paying attention. You can't charge the prices you want. You're doing all like the grunt work. But if you get good, right? If you get to the top 1% of something and 1% isn't actually that high because most people don't put in the effort, right? They don't put in the reps, they don't focus. Your profession is a leverage point. When you have the profession, the next thing is presence. And this is why people like us, normal people, get to build really cool businesses. The internet has remove like the gate holder of information right and so the ability to build presence this next leverage point is super super powerful it's it's not just uh lowered the barrier of entrepreneurship it's tore it down so what is presence it's reach times by reputation put another way how many people know you for the right reason for the right reason is the important bit right i saw some tiktokers recently drinking a dessert out of a toilet which quite literally stinks of desperation right <laughs> But if you can nail your reach and reputation around your profession, so you've specialized in the skill and you're building a brand, you are valuable to the market, you're irreplaceable to the market, you're getting quite high leveraged here. You can charge prices you want, you can pick who you work with. It's starting to get exciting, right? And we move on to the third pillar, which is product. If you ask, you, you'll never get rich selling out your time. You will always be busy selling out your time. So as a dentist, my tool, my leverage was my drills and my hands, right? So I, yeah, we're making six figures, but I'm working all the time. And your income looks like this, right? You hit the ceiling. But when you have a product, a way to deliver your knowledge at scale, that's leverage. Because suddenly you post something on social media, someone joins your email list, and they buy your product, you're not doing the work anymore. Right. And so now we've got these three pillars playing into each other. You're sick of what you do. People are paying attention and there's a way that they can buy something that's in a leverage thing. Could be a product, could be a productized service, i.e. this is the thing I do for other people and it's something that you can replicate over and over. This is when someone like normal gets six figures, seven figures, right? The next pillar, so we've got two more to go, is process. This is the bit I'm fascinated by. Process is like the the gasoline on the fire of being like, how many things can I automate? Can I delegate or can I systemize so that when I do my one thing well, the impact spreads? For example, I'm a writer. If I write a tweet, it's 20 seconds. From there, five, six softwares will firstly to post the tweet, right? So all my content is posting right now, right? So like that happens on a Monday morning, I schedule it out. Someone will sign up to my email list, which is auto-plugged by another bit of software. They get 10 emails from another software pitching my product that if they buy on a different software, they will then get pitched my two other products from a different software. They then get 30 days of emails based on that purchase, giving them more value, giving them my essays, giving them my podcasts. And so this 20 seconds of effort is turning to 100 hours of media. 
And that's how you're creating fans and process, right? And these little tweaks are everywhere in your business. So I do next to no non-creative work because I have trained my VA. My girlfriend is in the business too. We have systems. And so going through and being like, what can I automate? What can I delegate? What can I systemize? And what can I eliminate? Process is leverage. I'm online. I've got an army of robots at your disposal. And then from the final pillar then is people. What I mean by people, and this is a bit I screw up. I'm a writer, right? I... I disappear for months. I'm really hard to get a hold of. Like I suck at replying at messages. I thought you don't need people to do well, right? All that work for the four pillars, there is someone else doing the exact same thing in a different profession to a different audience. You and I right now are tapping into people leverage. I'm using your specialized skill set of podcasting, getting a brilliant pace, sick questions. You've got your great YouTube. Mm. And you get to tap into my ideas and my story. And so people is about having, A, you've got your audience, which is the most important, people behind you. You've got your peers, people together. Where Can we bring our businesses together? Can we kind of multiply our impact together? And then you have your mentors. The people that have spent years figuring out the thing you want to do, like you have to be able to tap into that. You have to like reach out. You have to pay for knowledge. And five pillars, these are the things if you focus on for five, 10 years, exponential results. Mm. Um, and, and then you know, well, where do you start and it, you, you start with your strengths man I think you have to start with the profession you have to get sick of what you do coming to a craft right the, you have to be so good they can't ignore you the rest is then playing to your strengths you're a brilliant interviewer people leverage your way I'm a writer presence was, was pretty handy to go for um, so yeah that's how I, you set me off on a spiel there but like that was like a masterclass right yeah there. it's a topic I, I think Leverage is exciting because, it, like I said, it really lowers the barrier of entrepreneurship. It, I'm, not, I'm not great at what I do, but I'm great at building leverage. Hmm. And if you understand leverage and compounding together, uh, it's the compounding where it's happening, right? Like you can put all these systems in place. If you do it for a month, nothing will happen. If you do it for 10 years, like it's crazy what's going to happen. And I'm four years into that and you're just seeing that compounding curve begin to kick off. So... Um, having faith in the models, man. Leverage and compounding. So way ahead. Okay. You know what? Here's where I, here's where I want to end. Um, we spoke about, we spoke about in the beginning, just the, the human that you were when you were in that dentistry job. And I think about you even saying like, you were, you were terrified of taking action. Mm. Like, terror like the you knew that you needed to make a change but quitting that job and doing something else and doing something that was truly for you was actually scary and there's always these thoughts of oh what am i going to do and you try the phone slips thing and then you try comedy and then writing and all of this stuff and there's still this question of like okay is it going to work how am i going to be able to do this thing i'm curious the kieran drew that sits before me now who understands things like leverage or email marketing, how to build audience, all of these things, there's a confidence in your skill set. Mm. And so I'm curious if that Kieran Drew, the Kieran Drew here, had to speak with the Kieran Drew that was a dentist and deeply unsure of what value he would provide. Mm. Just like, what would you say? What would the, what would the person now say to the person then? Mm. It's a good question. I think maybe two things. Uh, I think one for the mindset is back yourself. Never had faith in myself. That was the problem. It was always, oh, you were lucky to get this. You're lucky to get that. And, and you never really, you didn't have the confidence to back yourself. And that's a problem, right? Because then the way you think about it, that's always going to be the limiting factor. The other man, and uh, something I'm very fond of, fall in love with learning. Right, because the, the answers are out there, the knowledge is out there. And the sick part about the internet is there's a crazy amount of information. And you might not be the best. You might never get to be the best. But if you fall in love with learning about things and you start actually acting on the things you learn, uh, stuff happens. And suddenly you know that like it's like confidence is one one step at a time. And it's like if you fall in love with learning and just constantly be uh, following your curiosity. Only good things will happen, man. So yeah, I think it would just be back yourself. Keep learning, follow the curiosity. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on, man. It's been a pleasure, dude. Absolute pleasure. That was so good.